God compares an akazu so that my household can be full. So when a principality brings government, you need another agent to compare people to come. You can build a church but to be empty. So the Bible said from the days of thy youth thou hast known the holy scriptures which is able to make thee wise unto salvation. So you are saved but how you experience the fullness of salvation is a function of your understanding and application of the holy scriptures. 2 Timothy 3 from verse 15. And so every believer must have a thorough understanding of the word. And I've told you before that picking and quoting scripture or scriptures does not translate to an understanding of truth. Most times we quote scriptures out of context. That is why we are not transformed and that is why we don't command the results that scripture promises to command. For you to be transformed and for you to command result and authority through scripture beyond having a memory of isolated parchment of scriptural verses, you must have a thorough understanding of the spectrum of truth and light. This is why we are doing the series we are doing. And the subject we are looking at is walking in the reality of, Christi of the Christian life in the light of the New Testament or the practice of Christian life in light of the New Testament. Because there are many things you can do, but it is not consistent with the progression of revelation. For example, I can be trusting God for healing. And because I want healing, I can serve with all my heart. Why? The Bible said, Thou shalt serve the Lord thy God. He shall bless thy bread and thy water. And shall remove sickness from the midst of thee. That's a verse of scripture. You can exercise that scripture by faith. You can even have result. And many have result. But that's not where God is. Because if that's what you are doing. You can receive healing. And not have a relationship with God. God has moved from there. God proceeded and came to another level in his interaction. And he said you were wounded. He was wounded for your transgressions. He was bruised for your iniquities. The chastisement of your peace was upon him. By his stripes you were healed. That's a deeper revelation of God, his faithfulness, his love and mercy than the service that produces healing. Because if you are dealing at this level, it means beyond healing, you must know Jesus. So a man who serves to receive healing may not have a relationship with God, but he can exercise faith through service and get that healing. But the man who believes that by his stripes he was healed, beyond healing understands the love of God beyond healing understands the faithfulness of God and beyond healing he knows the person of Jesus and that's not all God now proceeded to saying if that same spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you he will quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit now this person operating here does not only know Jesus does not only know the faithfulness and the love of God but now he knows that he's one with God. Because God dwells on his inside. This person operating at this level of the quickening of the Holy Spirit is the one who is standing where God wants men to stand. He has a perfect revelation because he has transited from service to knowing the finished works of Christ to having an experiential relationship with God through the internal workings of the Holy Spirit. So you can quote the first scripture receive healing you may not be a mature christian this is the problem of many believers today they have a thousand and one verses that they quote but they don't have a vital relationship with god because they don't understand where god is in this revelational dealing with humankind and so there's no transformation there's no transfiguration there's no maturity in the things of god and for such people who have littered verses of scripture they don't understand the methods of God and so their conviction is shallow a day will come when they will apply those things they apply by isolated scripture and not have result their faith will begin to stagger but the one who now knows that he lives in God and God lives in him even if there is no result he is still standing there because this thing is beyond answers it has become a lifestyle this is what God wants us to all mature and come into 
And this is why we are doing this series. Now, in order to give context to the teaching, I first of all want to explain to you the different dispensations of the dealings of God with man. And I said the first dispensation is the dispensation from creation to the fall of man. And what did we call that dispensation? The dispensation of innocence. Man didn't know much. He was naive. And that was why the devil came casually and deceived him. So God related with man at that point as one who was innocent, having no understanding. Then you now proceeded to the second dispensation, which I said is the dispensation from the fall of man to the flood. And I call that dispensation what? The dispensation of conscience. Are you following this? Now that man has understood sin and understood um, life experientially, God will relate with him based on the rightness of his conscience. And so man began to exist on earth based on conscience. It was on the strength of that that Cain and Abel, the Bible said in the process of time, they felt it was right to offer sacrifice to God and they came to offer sacrifice because there is something within you now that leads you in your dealing with God. Until date, God still respects conscience but there are operations and dealings of God superior to conscience. You remember in Romans chapter 2, the Bible said those who died before Christ will be judged based on their conscience. So there are dealings of God even at that level. And I said the third dispensation is the dispensation from the flood to the call of Abraham. That dispensation is the dispensation of, the, of human government. So man wanted to operate based on his intelligence. Because at this point, even though God restored the world through Noah, men began to populate the world again and they started creating systems and they lived by that system. That's why in Genesis chapter 11, you have the Tower of Babel. They wanted to build a system as tall as the government of God to live like God without submitting to the government of God. Then, after the, that dispensation, then you have the dispensation of promise which began from the call of Abraham until the time of Moses, the era of the law. And in this dispensation, God called man out of the human government in order to establish a new covenant with man so that man will become his people. That was why Genesis 12 from verse 1, God had to call Abraham out of his country, out of his kindred, out of his father's house. All of that system is a government of rebellion. Man is living based on his intelligence, he's living based on his wisdom, he doesn't consort with God, neither does he live for God. I want to start a walk with a new set of people that submit absolutely to my government, living by my power and depending on me to survive. That was what he began with Abraham. Now, as God began to walk with Abraham, a point came when there was hardship on the face of the earth and the children of Abraham in the person of Isaac and 70 of his household went back into Egypt and connected with human government. God still took advantage of that and routed a way of escape until intervention was made. But at the end of time, God's program was this consistent. So God wanted them to come out. So God sent Moses. So there was a dispensation that began from Moses until Jesus Christ. So God sent Moses and the goal was to take them out of Egypt and take Egypt out of them. I want to show you my law, my standard, so that you understand that the government of this world is not the government of the Christ. The standard of God is not the standard of men. So now that you are coming out again from human government, you need to understand my standard so you live according to my standard. So that dispensation was called the dispensation of the law. And then you have the dispensation of grace that began from Jesus' first coming to Jesus' second coming. So God is dealing with man now based on the works of Jesus. And so John was speaking, he said, the law came by Moses. He said, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So right now, people work with God based on what Jesus has done. And then after the second coming of Jesus Christ, 
you have what we call the dispensation of the kingdom where the full scope of God's government will dwell with man. The Bible said, I saw the new earth descending from heaven. So a new earth came down from heaven. And in that new earth, there was the new Jerusalem. And the Bible said, in that city, they don't need the son. It said, Christ will become the son. That means, we live there in him, by him, and for him. So men will live in perfection, absolutely committed to the workings of the Holy Spirit. These are seven dispensations that defines God's total dealing with humankind. Now, for you to maximize your work with God, you need to understand the programs, the modalities, the modus operandi that governs the dispensation where you are. That is the only time you can maximize the reality and the resources of that dispensation. I said, of course, there is a dispensation before the dispensation of innocence. It's called the pre-Adamic dispensation. But you see, there's a lot of mysteries attached to it, and I want to do pure doctrine. So I avoided it. Maybe at another time, I will talk to you about the civilization that existed before Adam was created. Because there were princes on this earth. There was the first earth that was destroyed before there's the second earth. So there was a civilization ruling that realm, that era. You know, the Bible said in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And he said, and the earth was void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. There was judgment on the first earth. And the first earth was destroyed. This second earth too will be destroyed. The Bible said the elements of this world will melt. And everything will pass away. Until the third earth, which is the last earth, will descend from heaven. So we are not going to live in heaven naturally. We will return to the earth. But it will be the last earth. Or the third earth that God will create. That one will come from heaven into reality and materiality. But all of that is too mystical for this class. If I even want to teach that, I will teach it in a secluded setting so that when I talk, people who have spirit life and understand spirit language, we interact with it in the spirit. Otherwise, dead men will carry scripture with their brain and they'll be arguing what they don't know. So there are some things you can't teach except Paul said we, we speak wisdom amongst them that are perfect not with the whole church <laughs> if not they'll be arguing on youtube and it will affect the faith of the children so we'll leave that praise god so there are dispensations and i said although there are dispensations the way god deals with humanity is through covenants because god is spirit he doesn't function by emotion that's why you can't love a, a lady and then you you start living together as husband and wife god will recognize it he respects your love, but he won't be part of that relationship except there's covenant. That's how spirits relate with men. Because a covenant is a legal transaction. And that transaction is backed by an oath. So there are conditions and commitment that back that transaction. And on the strength of that covenant, God will bring himself down to relate with his creation. So if there's no covenant, God cannot function. And so we say cut across the different dispensations there are five major covenants that god has caught with humanity that determined god's dealings with man i won't go into the details again because of my time i said number one we have the noahi covenant after the earth was destroyed in the flood god said to himself i will no longer destroy man he, he decided not to destroy man again because of his sin he said, therefore, he will cut a covenant with man to preserve him. And so God entered the covenant of preservation with man. You'll find that scripture in Genesis chapter 9 from verse 1 to 17. I, I gave you all the scriptures so you can revert to the next class. I'm just giving context to what I want to share tonight. Praise God. So there was covenant of exemption. And I said the way that covenant is activated is by sowing and reaping. Genesis 8, 20 to 22, seed time and harvest cold and heat, summer and winter shall not cease as far as the earth remaineth. And I said the token of that covenant is the rainbow. Genesis 9 verse 12 and 13. So every time you see the rainbow, know that the earth and everything on earth, not just man, even animals, donkeys, cows will be preserved. The earth will not be destroyed for man's sake because of that covenant. Now, that is why God intervenes in the affairs of man. When man is in danger, there is now a legality, a legal basis for God, to, for God to intervene. Because there is a covenant now that mandates God 
to intervene in man's situation without violating himself. Then God went further to a superior covenant, which is the covenant of sufficiency. It's not enough to be saved. Your necessities must be met. He now cut a new covenant with Abraham. So in this covenant, God blessed man. God brought man to a point where he's not just blessed, but he becomes the blessing. So Genesis 17, verse 1 to 12, you'll see the details of that covenant, but it was promised in Genesis chapter 12, from verse 1 to 3. Get thee out of thy country, get thee out of thy kindred, get thee out of thy father's house, in blessings, I will bless you. Whoever blesses you is blessed, whoever causes you is cursed, in thee shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. So God decided to bring man into sufficiency. The very word blessed means empower to prosper. So God cut a covenant with man to empower him to prosper regardless of the situation. So on one point, he wanted to protect and preserve man, but he went further to prosper the man. And I said, the way to activate that covenant is by faith and circumcision. Those were the tokens God gave. If you don't believe, you will not have that covenant find expression. And that was why God insisted until Abraham believed. The symbol of course, circumcision. But God does not just want to provide for man. Because God can provide for man and man will be lawless and sinful. So God went further to a superior covenant. This shows you God's value system. God wants to protect you. But beyond protecting you, God wants to bless you. Beyond blessing you, God wants you to live at his realm by his laws and according to his standard because even you who is a man you can't keep giving money to your son and he's smoking away the whole money so it's not just about giving him what he needs it's about who he becomes because of what you are giving him you can't be giving your son money and he's womanizing with that money living recklessly you say hey boy stop there what's your problem i'm not providing for you to destroy yourself so at one point he must come under government so god went further from the covenant of sufficiency to the covenant of ethics, value system, and righteousness to prove to man his standard. I have a way I live in my kingdom. And so that was when the covenant he had with Moses was activated. And I said, the way you activate that covenant is by obedience. So if you don't obey God's law, you cannot walk in God's realm. And I said, the symbol of that covenant is the Ten Commandments. That was why God gave his laws. This is my standard. But God didn't stop there. God still went further to a superior covenant, which is the Davidic covenant. And in the Davidic covenant, God wanted man to truly become like him. So that's where God exhorted man to become a king. So God promised David, Second Samuel, you see that from chapter 7, verse 9 to 12, or to 13 thereabout, where God told David he will make him a king forever and ever. So at this point, God is not protecting man anymore. He's doing something beyond protecting man. He's not just providing for man. He's doing something beyond providing for man. He's not just doing something beyond providing for man. He has also showed man his standard and value system. And ultimately, he has made man like himself. So man now has the authority that God has to do what God can do. So now he's a king and he's a priest. So on one side, he has relationship with God because he has been taught the protocol of relationship. And on another side, he has authority to exercise government. Are you following the sequence? So in the Davidic covenant, we were made kings and priests. And I said the way to activate that covenant is by intimacy. When you begin to build intimacy with God, when you begin to draw close to God, and demonstrate it through brokenness. You will see that authority will be rising in your life. This is why the Bible said, if you humble yourself, God will exhort you. So kingship is a function of humility and brokenness. So activating that covenant is by brokenness. And the token of that covenant is intimacy. But I said all of these four covenants are types and shadows of the real covenant God wants to have with man. So in Jeremiah 31, from verse 31 to 34, God said, I will cut a new covenant with my people. And in this covenant, God began to show us how it will work. Number one, he said his law will be written in our hearts. 
Number two, he said, no man shall teach his brother to know the law. Everybody will know God from his spirit. Number three, he said, I will be their God and they shall be my people. Because the old covenant, the Bible said, they could not keep it. So not one of them was fulfilled. Because in all of this first co four covenant, man wanted to keep it by his own ability. But often his ability failed. So even though God is using this covenant to show man his plan, he is also using this covenant to show man that in yourself, you can never be anything. Because on one side, the covenant shows you God's plans. God's plan is to protect you, provide for you, transform you, and make you be like him. God's plan is to show you that he loves you and he wants an intimate relationship with you. So you begin by giving God your resources. You move from trusting God to support you. You move to living according to God's standard. And then you come to a point where God's resources automatically become your resources because now he has gotten your heart. He showed you intimacy. But over and above that, because nobody could keep it, God showed man that the flesh profits nothing. So there was a need for a new covenant. And in this new covenant, God didn't cut the covenant with fallen man anymore. God actually cut the covenant with himself. So what God did was that God became man in the person of Jesus. So Jesus represented the human race. And so God entered into covenant with God. On one side, the father represented the Godhead. On another side, the son represented humanity. So God cut a new covenant with man through himself. And in this covenant, number one, sin was washed away for the first time. Man can be without guilt. Number two, eternal life was given to man. So for the first time, man could live from the economy of the God life. Number three, God now entered inside man to live from within man. So man no longer functioned by his own ability, but the ability of God that is in him. And then number four, man becomes part and parcel of God's family and God's program on the earth. Because indeed, he is now a king. This is God's plan. And this is what God achieved in Christ Jesus. But I said, as simple as this thing is, it is when you start living out your Christian life that you will know whether you understand this covenant. Because it is in your Christian life that the actual precision and accuracy in understanding is revealed. In the light of that, we began to check some of the practices in the Christendom that shows where we are functioning, whether we are still in the old or in the new. And so we began by touching a few things. And the first thing we touched was giving. And in dealing with giving, we looked at first fruit and we looked at tithing. And we said, if you notice from scripture, in most of these covenants, you'll see that these principles are consistent, but they have different meanings. Are you following? They have different meanings. And it's our understanding and meaning applied to these principles that shows whether we bear the consciousness of the new covenant. I've explained first food twice, so I won't touch it again. But I'll just recap tithing, and then we proceed. I said there are three things or four things about Titan. Number one, to understand what Titan represents in God's economy. Number two, to understand how Titan is done in the different covenants. Number three is to understand the implication of Titan. And number four is to verify whether Titan is still necessary in the new covenant. And so to understand what title represent in the realm of God by studying the new covenant and all the other covenants we said number one titan is an indication of acknowledgement of God as your source and so if God is your source whatever comes to you you will give a part to him as a sign of acknowledgement this is why we read from Genesis 14 Verse 20 and 23. When Abraham returned from the spoils of war, and he came with from, from the battle of the great kings, and he came with the spoils of war, the first thing we saw Abraham did was that he gave a tithe to Melchizedek because he acknowledged him as the priest of God. So Abraham did that in acknowledgement that I fought this battle and conquered, 
not because I was a strong man, not because I was a strategic man, it's because God preserved me. Because in verse 23, when the king of Sodom came and told Abraham to take the spoils, he said, I will not take even a latchet from you, lest you say you made Abraham rich. So what was Abraham saying? God is my provider. God is the one who makes me rich. Not men, not the systems of the world. And invariably, he is also saying God is the one that preserves me. So when he gave that tithe, he was making a statement. Number two, we say tithing in this kingdom indicates consecration. That means everything you have belongs to God. And the way you show it is that you dedicate a portion of it as a seal of consecration. Because the Bible said in John 6, 21, he said where a man's heart is, that is where his treasure is. So you are telling God that I belong to you. Therefore, everything I have belongs to you. And so anything that comes to you, you take a portion of it and present it to God. So it becomes your seal of consecration. Now, the reason you use 10% is because across the practice of scripture, you see that the lowest level that people went to was 10%. Why will you go below 10%? But we say because your statement now is that you belong to God, you can give even beyond 10%. Because it is now a mark of consecration. Number three, we say every time you give your tithe, it's a statement of worship. Because when you acknowledge God as your source, you are invariably worshiping God with your resources. The Bible said to honor the Lord with your substance. The word honor in the context of the spirit is not just to bend down and respect. Honor is not respect. Honor is reverential worship. And so when Proverbs 3, 9 says to honor the Lord with your substance, he is commanding you, teaching you one of the ways to worship God is with your substance. You worship God with your words. You worship God with your actions. You worship God with your service. You also worship God with your substance. And one of the ways you demonstrate that worship is in consecration to take a part of whatever comes to you first. Before you even spend it on yourself, you take a part of it and say, God comes first. That's why Titan is not just taking 10%. It's actually taking the first 10% and giving it to God. You don't spend your money and remember and spare 10%. No, that's not worship. The moment it comes, before you spend it on yourself, you say, Father, this is your own. And you honor the Lord with it before you begin to spend on yourself. When God sees it, his focus is not the 10%. It's the action of worship and honor that your life is demonstrating. So we said in the realm of God, tithing means something very sacred to God. It means worship. It means acknowledgement. It means honor. It means faith. It means consecration. And finally, it means royalty to your king. That means you are saying God is your Lord. And that's why Malachi chapter 3 verse 8 to 10 say, Will a man rob God? Lord, you didn't go with me to the bank. I was the one who labored for 30 days and got my salary. How come not giving you my salary translate to robbing? If I am your Lord, if I am your king, it means everything you have belongs to me. And so the way you demonstrate it is by taking a portion of tithe and offering and presenting to me. So when we give those titan, it's royalty. Now I said in the light of the New Testament, God does not curse you if you don't tithe. Because you can't curse him that is blessed. When Israel was about to be blessed and Balaam was brought to curse them, the Bible said <laughs> you can't curse them. For God has already blessed them. He said there's no enchantment against Jacob. There's no divination against Israel. So we are not giving our tithe. And mark my words, I'm not saying pain. I'm saying giving. We are not giving our tithe because this is consecration, this is worship, this is honor. We are not giving our tithe because we are afraid of causes. We are the blessed of the Lord. We are giving it as a mark of consecration. We are giving it as an act of worship. We are giving it as royalty to our king. And even if we don't, God will curse us. And trust me, I've experimented both. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm a, I'm, forgive me. <laughs> I, I'm a, a stubbornness. <laughs> There was a time I stopped tithing. I said, I want to see if I'll become poor. <laughs> I want to see if I'll be cursed. And I'm waiting for the devourer. And I didn't tithe for a while and nothing happened. I'm not saying don't do it. And this is, this one is, this is not doctrine. Delete this one from what you heard. I'm just telling you me. 
So I know, both by experience and by doctrine, that you are not cursed if you don't tithe. But if you don't tithe, you are not mature. That means your money is not consecrated to God. That means you don't acknowledge God as your source. That means you don't acknowledge God as your king. And that also means you don't worship God with your substance. You don't honor God with your substance. That's why we do what we do. We are blessed. And I also told you that the devourer cannot destroy you. Because in the context of the New Testament, God has given us all power. The authority of God is with us. The power of God is with us. So what God would have used to rebuke the devourer is now with me. So I don't need to wait for God to rebuke the devourer. When the devourer come, I say, I am seated with Christ in heavenly places, far above principalities and powers, dominion, every name that is named. Because you are called devourer in the name of Jesus. Get out! And he has no choice but to go. So I'm not going to be devoured because I'm not paying tithe. And I won't go to hell because I'm not paying tithe. Because my going to hell is not because of what I give. My going to heaven and living with God in eternity is because of what God gave. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Is that clear enough? So this is the mindset of the New Testament. So we give tithes because it's not abolished. Matthew 23 verse 23. Jesus said there are higher things in the kingdom. He said but don't neglect tithe. He spoke of faith. He spoke of mercy. He spoke of justice. He said those are higher matters. Nevertheless, don't neglect the little ones like Titan. So Titan is not abolished, but it's not a major syllabus in the kingdom. There are superior syllabus in this kingdom. 